Um, hello, good evening, everybody. Um, just want to, um, there's a few more people just joining. I will admit them as um, as they come in, but um, it is seven o'clock now, so I'll kick off. Um, just wanted to welcome you all um, to um, the talk by David Farthing this evening. It's our fourth event of um, of the year, and we're really, really pleased that having got rid of the um, the um, limit of 100 that we've had such big audiences, um, now, lots of you have been before um, and have know how it works, but I'll just go through the running order for those of you who haven't. Um, um, essentially, I'm going to pass over to Bruce Parker shortly. He will do some introductions and then um, he'll pass over to David. Um, the presentation is probably is a little bit longer than some of the presentations we've had recently. Um, it's probably about an hour. Um, and then there will be a chance for questions afterwards. Obviously, if you do need to, to, to leave on the hour, um, please don't feel embarrassed. It's not like being in a room. Um, when we get to the questions and answers, you can either send them on the chat or you can just um, or send me an email or you can um, just sort of unmute yourself and, um, and ask the question. Um, so I will um, pass over to Bruce now. Now, Bruce, are you able to unmute yourself? Yes, yes you I are. Have yes. Done, I hope. Yeah. Hope everybody can hear me. Uh, thank you very much indeed. Uh, I, we've got people who aren't friends uh, of the cathedral, I think, joining us, and a big welcome to them. Um, I think we've got the Beaconsfield Historic Society and the Historic Diving Society. So, very oh. pleased you've been able to join us uh, for this uh, lecture. Uh, as as, as uh, Lucy said, my name is Bruce Parker. I'm chairman uh, of the Friends. Uh, this I've been associated with this uh, Winchester uh, diver story. It is a big story, actually. The cathedral been in, uh, involved with it before because in another life I was uh, a BBC reporter, and uh, one of the big stories was that actually the statue we had of William Walker wasn't actually William Walker. It was a complete mistake by the authorities of the cathedral. It was a statue of somebody else about which they were very embarrassed. Now I'm sure uh, David's going to tell us about that uh, in his lecture. So I'm not going to waste any more time. Uh, we're very grateful to David. He is the big expert on 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 the, uh, the diver. Uh, and so over to you, David. And thanks very much indeed for doing this for us, David. David, are you having problems unmuting yourself? No, I'm unmuted. No. David, can you unmute yeah. yourself? I'm there now. Right, thank you. Thank you, thank you, Bruce. And thank you for the invitation to talk to you this evening. In her fascinating talk to us some weeks ago, entitled the things they did not teach me at theological college, the first thing that Dean Catherine mentioned was that people love their building. We're very lucky to have a beautiful building like this, which everybody loves. But over the years, there have been many threats uh, to our great cathedral. The Reformation, the Civil War, and of course, the Second World War. However, surely the worst was highlighted in the architect's report of January 1905, in which he warned that the east end of the cathedral was in imminent danger of collapse. My presentation describes how this problem was addressed and how the foundations were made secure. This unique and successful project is now acknowledged as one of the greatest engineering preservation feats of its time. Although there are some 150 men involved, the man of the moment was no doubt the deep sea diver, William Walker, whose work laboring for almost seven years beneath the failing foundations caught the public's imagination and today continues to attract interest from far and wide. Many people have kindly provided material and photos and assisted me in my research and preparation. I must thank David Rymo, the cathedral archivist, Dr. John Cook, past cathedral archeologist, 
Joan Bartholomew, past cathedral curator, the late Dr. John Bevan and Gary Wallace Potter of the Historic Diving Society, the Institution of Civil Engineers, head librarian, Carol Morgan, Nick Cox, the cathedral architect, one of Walker's granddaughters, Margaret Warner, and my fellow guides, Peter Innes, Simon Newman, and Julie Adams. I'm a retired civil engineer, hence my deep interest in this unique project. It might be worth mentioning that whilst engineers and architects happily work together on a wide range of projects, there's often light-hearted professional banter between the two. This is often instigated by engineers who teasingly highlight the fact that whilst architects create grand schemes, the engineers are often left to make sure the schemes actually work and are often the ones left to get their hands dirty. I shall allude to this and also include one or two other light-hearted moments. So please don't take it all too seriously, especially any architects listening this evening. I divide this talk into more or more or less four parts. First of all, I describe the problem. And then we go on to outlining how the project was instigated and carried out. And then we talk about the key people who were part of this amazing project. And finally, I talk about the great party and the great celebration that took place when it was all completed. Winchester Cathedral, it was built on the Itchen floodplain. And uh, here you can see in green the floodplain and you can see an arrow pointing towards the uh, cathedral, which can you, you can see is in the middle of this floodplain. A slightly larger scale drawing shows the floodplain outlined in green at the edges. And then what we know is that underneath the silt and sand that lies on the, uh, in the um, bed is a deep gravel bed, which would have been a great foundation if the cathedral builders had managed to get that deep. But we know now that when they extended the cathedral a hundred years later in 1207, this, that end of the cathedral went out over the area where the gravel was at its highest. And that's the area where most of the problems have occurred. This is a cross section cut through Winchester and you should be able to see at the bottom there, at the bottom of the valley, which is where the cathedral is, there is gravel, but mostly peat and silt. Not an ideal foundation for our great cathedral. No, they didn't have drones in those days. This is a model of the, the cathedral being built. And unfortunately, we don't own it, but this is in a museum in France, um, which is a uh, uh, gives a pretty good impression of all the work involved in putting the great cathedral together. It's actually at the Bayeux Museum in <coughs> northern France. I mentioned briefly that the cathedral was extended in, in 1107, uh, sorry, in 1202. It was completed 100 years earlier, and then Bishop de Lucy decided to extend the East End, and that's what you can see in red. And that's where it's the most, where the most problems have occurred. They had wind of the fact that the ground wasn't so good at the East End. And here's an interesting old picture of the monks supervising the laying of some huge beech logs on top of the ground before they started building the extension in an attempt to spread the load of the massive walls of the extended cathedral. Um, that's a bit of the historic 
um, background. Now something about the problem itself. Meet the Dean, the man in charge, the very reverent Mordant Ferno. He'd been headmaster at Repton and fortunately he was a good administrator as he was the one responsible for all aspects of cathedral life, including major projects. The, uh, the cathedral have a part-time architect who can be called upon whenever needed. And at that time, it was a man called John Colson. He had a family practice in Winchester. And one of his jobs was to submit an annual report to the Dean and Chapter concerning the fabric of the cathedral. In my introduction, I mentioned that engineers feel that architects never get their hands dirty. Mm -hmm. I'd just like to point out to you his polished shoes and his beautiful white shirt and his white handkerchief there, even though he's carrying out a site inspection. Anyway, his report of January 1905 did not make encouraging reading. The West Front, an evil contingent of fragments of stone falling on the main entrance below the crypt, alarming cracks symptomatic of faulty foundations. The South Presbytery Wall leaning outwards at an alarming angle. And in a masterly understatement, he said to the Dean and Chapter, it's not my desire to appear alarmist, but I feel it's my duty to invite the very serious attention of the chapter to these matters. The South Transit, that is one of the windows in the South Transit uh, looking towards the east with massive cracks up to a foot wide either side of the window. The crypt, this massive crack in the crypt uh, is still there for all to see how bad the cracks were and last of all, perhaps the worst crack of all, is this one in the South Presbytery Isle Wall. And that was needed to be repaired, of course, at the time. And this now, you can still see where this repair, where this repair has taken place. The South Presbytery Isle Wall was leaning out at quite an angle and those of you with good sized screens should be able to see the architect there on those mm -hmm. steps. Yeah, yeah. Pointing to a plumb line hanging down. If you can't see the plumb line, I've drawn a red line down so you can see how much the cathedral is leaning. It's leaning about a third of the amount that the tower at Pisa, the leaning tower at Pisa, is leaning. So it's leaning out about one, about 18 inches, which is about a third of what the Leaning Tower Pisa is leaning. Um, it's interesting, this is the architect uh, plumbing it, but in a, a, another place in London, St Paul's Cathedral, apparently had a similar problem, but there the Dean of Chapter decided to do the plumbing. And this is an amusing cartoon I managed to find. But as you can see, if you look at St Paul's Cathedral there, it looks as if they had a slightly more serious problem than we had. Anyway, that's the Dean and Chapter at St Paul's taking an interest in their cathedral. So much for the background and the problems. The 40 foundations at the East End were the worst of the problems. And so the eminent diocesan architect, Thomas Jackson, was appointed. He'd been apprenticed under Gilbert Scott, and he was 69 when he began his work at Winchester. And his main uh, work was his superb designs at the University at Oxford. And there's one of them. Any, any of you who know Oxford will recognize that, Hartford College. He organized a uh, site investigation, and these are the results of the investigation. They dug a pit down beside the wall. You should be able to see the wall there, and you can see the pit going down to the solid gravel at the bottom. 
you can see some beech logs lying there immediately beneath the foundation, which I talked about. And you can see the water table, which is not far below the foundations. And then you have a layer of marley clay and then six foot or so of very, very soft, wet peat. Thereby lies the problem that occurred. Soft, wet peat. And all, almost worth to worsen it, there was a layer of silt just at the bottom of that peat which made life even more difficult for the people doing the uh, repairs. They needed a civil engineer. What a shame isn't Bard Kingdom Brunel had died 50 years earlier, the greatest of them all. But Jackson recommended one of the next generation of great engineers, Francis Fox, renowned for his works on underwater projects. Um, that's him there. And his father, Sir Charles, Sir Charles, founded a family firm. And Francis, together with his brother, continued that firm for many years. He worked a lot with James Greathead, who I'll mention in a few minutes, because it was James Greathead who developed pressure grouting, which is used a lot these days in the construction of tunnels. Fittingly, he had deep religious beliefs, no Sunday working on projects, and I'm sure all those running services in the cathedral were only too pleased that work stopped on a Sunday. And he had the great idea of recycling <laughs> linen drawings, um, not needed any longer, and making them into bandages. And it's recorded that 121 miles of bandages were sent to hospitals in France during the Second World War during the First World War, sorry. This is one of Fox's projects, one of the last underground tunnels through London. And you won't be able to read it, but I like showing this picture because in the caption, it says, photographed unexpectedly, all the men at work. Uh, I think that is a surprise because in those days, when there was a photograph being taken, every, everybody stopped and smiled at the camera. Another one of Fox's great jobs was the Mersey Tunnel. So he was well qualified to deal with major civil engineering problems underwater. He recommended four emergency measures. One, shoring the south walls, the South Presbytery Isle Wall and the South Transit. He erected arch centering in the retroquoir to support the roof at the poor area where the most damage had been done inside the cathedral. He instructed steel tie rods to be built across the cathedral at the east end from the outside on one side right through to the outside of the other wall. And you can just see it, the arrow pointing at the rod there, and you can still see those today. And on the right is a picture of the rod where it comes out of the wall with a very fancy nut on the end. The fourth thing Fox recommended was solidifying the crumbling walls with the great head grouting machine. And air pressure was used to blow out all the accumulated dust of ages and various things came out, owls, martins and rats. So you can tell there was lots of cracks and spaces in there. Then some 500 tons of liquid cement were inserted under pressure into the walls to solidify them before they started work. The initial underpinning process was to move from the state on the left there. You can see the wall as it was sitting on its beach logs and through the clay and how it diagrammatically it shows how the weight of the wall was pressing on the peat and compressing it. And then to the right is what was needed to be the finished project, to have all that peat removed and to be raced, re replaced by mass concrete and brick. 
and uh, they did go about starting to keep, dig pits uh, like that. There's a diagram of the pits around the east end of the cathedral, and they got as far as digging four pits, but they found that they were having to pump so, so fast to keep the water out. They just could not cope with the amount of water. Even a new great steam pump they brought into place was unable to cope. Um, also, Fox was very disturbed when a lot of silt began appearing in the water. And that gave him a, a worry that it was drawing silt from underneath adjacent foundations. So the pumping had to be stopped. And Fox proposed an ingenious solution. Bring in a deep sea diver, bring in a diver, and this would sort it out. Now, this is how the diver worked. A pit was excavated down beside the wall, down to a level just above the gravel. Uh, the pits were about six foot wide. And eventually they worked round the whole cathedral digging these pits. But when one pit was almost complete, the men dug down right to just before they hit the gravel. And then the, all the water came rushing in, of course, because the water they were well below the water table. And then when the water had settled a bit, they sent down a diver. And he went down and he removed all the peat from underneath the foundation. You can see him there at the bottom of the pit. And you can see he's removed a lot of the peat from underneath the foundation, which is above us there. He then, they lowered down to him drags, bags of dry mixed concrete which he placed on the gravel base. And you should be able to see him doing that there. And these bags were placed three or four layers deep. After the concrete has set, the water could be safely pumped out without drawing any more silt in from, the, from beneath the rest of the cathedral. That's what Fox was so worried about, was that the pumping water out was drawing silt from underneath the rest of the cathedral. But having sealed the bottom of the, the uh, gravel there, the mason and, and pumped the water out, the masons could then go down into the dry pit to build a new foundation to connect up onto the, to the underneath of the old medieval foundation. That's really the fundamental key point about this project. As they dug lots of more pits and they worked around the whole cathedral, they proved, as they suspected, that the gravel was deeper down as they got nearer the river, further east. And this is a, a sketch by the, uh, by the foreman of the contractor, who appeared to be a very good draftsman, showing very clearly how the trouble was towards the east of the cathedral where all the settlement occurred, there was a greater depth of travel and more peat. Yeah. The man chosen for the job was one William Walker, who's become known as a legendary man as the Winchester diver. This is him with his, uh, his assistant, a very important man for him. Uh, he dressed him and uh, he had a line to him the whole time, which Walker signaled him if he wanted to come out in a hurry in particular. And bear in mind that suit and equipment weighed 200 pounds. Of course, it got lighter when he got into the water, but moving about on the surface was quite a problem. Quite a special man, William Walker, or was William Walker. He was born in 1869, trained at HMS Werner down in Portsmouth. He joined Zeba Gorman and he spent four years at a dockyard in Gibraltar. 
His first wife bore him five children. And when she died, her sister Alice brought up the children and then married Walker, and she bore him an additional seven children. Wow. Busy man, busy man. He worked two shifts of three and a half hours plus every hour, plus every hour, including and undressing. For lunch, he told us, told the people he ate mutton pie and he smoked his pipe because he climbed the nicotine to preserve him when he was working in grave infected ground. He died sadly in 1918, aged 49, during the Spanish flu epidemic. A poignant point to make today. Um, his family life is recorded in uh, the Winchester Cathedral record, number 57, section 11. And also you can see much more about him and his life in the Oxford Dictionary of National Biography. This is him descending. This is him at work. You can see two pumping there. There was always a spare man, but the man on the left was his main sig and supporter, sig uh, William West. Uh, that's an interesting picture that was taken from the Illustrated London, and it, it reminds you the way of what a dark, dead, very lonely job he had down there. Completely dark, he won't be able to see anything, and he spent three and a half hours digging and placing these sacks every morning and every afternoon. And in a pub next door to the cathedral called the Wind Walker, they have a lot of mementos there and a lot of memorabilia. And amongst it is a pump, a smaller pump than would have been used for William Walker. But very interesting looking the instructions there. If Walker was down, one pull, he wanted more air. One, two pulls, slack off the lifeline. And three pulls, help me out immediately. With his dresser and attendant, eventually left the, uh, left the job and he opened a, uh, a fish and chip shop nearby in Andover Road. And these are the tiles from his fish and chip shop. You see his name there, William West. And these tiles are in the Winchester Museum. Reports by Francis Fox, uh, they always were, mo he was most impressed with the work of the diver. Here's one, dear Mr. Dean, Mr. Walker, the diver has done his work in an excellent manner. And I have pleasure in testifying to the zeal which he is displaying to secure a thoroughly satisfactory result. One very strange and surprising thing about William Walker, and don't take it too seriously, but we have heard that he didn't like getting wet. Uh, we have two portraits in the cathedral. One was presented to the friends of the cathedral and is shown on the left there, presented by his daughter, Alice Netley. And on the right is one commissioned by the former chairman of Sieber Gorman, who is the firm that William Walker worked for. And that is by Japanese artist Ishii Bashley. The working teams, the contractors John Thompson of Peterborough had up to 140 men at any one time. And uh, the specialists were the divers gang who did all the work of digging the pits and generally looking after Walker and his signalman. That's a picture looking down a pit after the replacing of the stone blocks and the bricks had been completed. And you can see a layer of brickwork there. And on the right is a picture of, the, of, of some of the bags of dry mixed concrete after they've been placed 
and were ready for the um, for the masons to go down and start placing their block work on it. 150,000 blocks were placed and 900,000 bricks and in all 250 pits were dug. The final stage of the work was the South Nave Isle. Um, and there the architect Jackson decided that as well as underpinning, the operation you can see being done there on the left, new buttresses were needed. And these 10 completed buttresses are shown there in their brand new state. They've weathered nicely now and look part of the scene. It, it wasn't all hard work. The main contractors formed a football team and the league results for 1908 show that Winchester Cathedral won the league that year. The men's spiritual welfare, William West, his assistant stated, Canon Braithwaite used to give the men very nice entertainments and hold a service every Friday. What did it cost? Well, in today's money, in today's money, the first estimate was £350,000. And yes, yes, you'll never guess. By the time it was finished, it had cost approximately £12 million. HS2 was going on, and it's not a, a new idea what's happening with HS2. Those were some of the people who contributed. Uh, the king himself, King Edward VII, the Bishop of Winchester, the Archdeacon, Canons, and one in particular, they had the idea of when they'd taken these beech logs out of from under the foundations, when they installed the new foundations, they decided to carve, make carvings out of the beech logs and sell them as souvenirs to raise funds. And there's a gentleman selling uh, souvenirs Carl from Beach Logs and uh, stood at the West End. And he's stood at, a, stood at a stand at a stall there. And in the pub in uh, Hyde, now here, there on the wall, there was a mock up of this, uh, of this stand, the stall which he was using. The curator. It was by uh, Joe Bartholomew. She often gets people offering her things from their houses, which prove to be carved from the beach logs. And there's a display of some of them. And a friend of mine who might be with us tonight, I won't be able to see, I'm afraid, he actually has a lovely carved box, a lovely carved cupboard which on it has wood from Cathedral Foundation, 700 years underwater stated there, and on the back it signs roughly in the wood by the Dean, Mordant Furno. So much for the project. What about the party? You'll be pleased to hear when I start talking about the party, we're moving on well through the presentation. Thanksgiving service on St. Swithin's Day, 15th of July, 1912, the royal arrival. What a fantastic picture with King Alfred greeting King George V and Queen Mary. There is the King and Queen at the service and a copy of the service sheet. The Archbishop gave the sermon and he used as his text Prosper thou the work of our hands upon us. The awards to the three main characters, the diocesan architect was made a baron, was uh, given a baronetcy, oh. Sir Thomas Jackson. The civil engineer was knighted, Sir Francis Fox. And the diver, William Walker, was disposed by the king to be a member of the Royal Victorian Order. I, only in the gift of the King, I gather. 
other key players were the uh, were the, the were the dean and the clerk of works on the left there, and uh, the contractor's foreman Charles Ra. Um, I always feel the dean deserved more fuss to be made of him, since it was on his broad shoulders that the managing the contract and taking it forward fell. But you'll be pleased to hear that... Sorry, I've gone too far. So I can't say, but there are some gates installed in his memory with the nice words um, about the gates, the cathedral being made secure during his tenure. There we are. These gates are placed in memory of William Warden Ferno, during whose tenure of office the foundations were made secure. Are the foundations now secure? Yes, yes, indeed. Imperial College students made a study in 07, measuring how much it had moved in the last 20 years or so, and came up with a figure of two millimetres. Also around the cathedral, there's still evidence of tail tails on the left there, little blobs, blobs of cement that they put on cracks, which they thought might worsen during the work. And you can see that one's dated 06, 1906. And so it hasn't formed any cracks during the construction and since. And the current architect keeps a very close eye on it. And this is equipment for measuring any movement that takes place. How would the underpinning be done today? Well, one Gwilym Roberts, quite a leading civil engineer in the Institute of Civil Engineers, he once proposed for a project like this, micropiling very small diameter piles, a large number of them could be drilled from the surface through the wall, through the clay, through the peat and into the solid gravel below. There's two statues on display. Um, the one on the left is at the east end of the cathedral by Gwilym Williams and one quite a bit older is on the way as you walk into the uh, refectory. Um, that's an interesting picture of Fox, Walker and the architect Colson. Um, Fox was a qualified diver and he's in the diving suit because he'd been down, like good, also, good engineers, he'd been getting his hands dirty and inspecting the work. And there he is in the diving gear just having come up. And that is Walker himself in the middle and the cathedral architect, Coulson. There has been a lot of controversy about statues because the first one was sculpted by Sir Charles Wheeler and it turned out to look a little bit more like Fox rather than this sturdy, burly man with a moustache. And uh, the family who were there at the unveiling were very disappointed but the two, they are very happy now with the two uh, statues I've just shown you. And they are the ones now in place. Walker's grave, so he died in October 18 in the epidemic. He's buried at Elmer's End Cemetery near Beckenham. And in 1930, 1989, the cathedral guy, John Patton, raised funds for his grave to be refurbished and it was rededicated on the 29th of October. And again, it was a good article in the Winchester Cathedral record about the rededication of the grave. 2018 was the 100th anniversary of Walker's death. And Dean Catherine was invited to unveil a plaque on Walker's house in South Norwood. And there she is unveiling the plaque. And that is the plaque itself, the deep sea diver who saved Winchester Cathedral while living here. 
a lot of their descendants and relatives came to that occasion. And there is Dean Catherine with three generations of descendants. Three granddaughters, a great granddaughter, and a great, great granddaughter. Because he had so many children, there are lots of descendants around. <laughs> and quite often at the cathedral, they make themselves known. And so for the commemoration service, we were able to, on 6th of October, 2018, we got in touch with a lot of them. And quite a few of them came and placed flowers at his grave, at his statue. And amazingly, one of Walker's sons, uh, uh, William, he was another William, he stowed away on a ship to Canada, we're told, and he fought for Canada in the First World War. When he came back, he made his way down to uh, the United States, and uh, <clears throat> so there are lots of descendants in the States with whom we're on contact. And here is a family of four from Kentucky who came all the way from Kentucky just to take part in the commemoration service on St. Swithin's Day. Uh, you can see granddaughter Lorraine on the right there, and then the rest of her family, Gwendolyn, Jeff, and Charlotte. Amazing that they prepared to come all the way just to pay their respects. That's one of the uh, notes on some of the flowers. Grandad, we're so proud of you and your great achievement um, of saving this magnificent cathedral. He is, must have been a very, very special man. He's remembered by many, many people. Now, as just a final heartfelt thanks, how he if he'd been still been here, I think he would have liked to have been thanked like this. I did show this to the Dean and she was quite happy me to show that picture to all of you. Let me finish with the words that the Archbishop finished with, with in his sermon. And so in days to come, when men are talking of Walklin and a Lucy, of Wickham and Bishop Fox, there will be more to add. The names of Bishop Ryle, Dean Furno, and the trio of redoubtable men, the great architect, Thomas Jackson, the resourceful engineer, Francis Fox, and finally, the working diver, William Robert Walker, will hold place for good in the annals of our century's beginnings. I'm sure you agree that uh, uh, we show a lot of thanks to all those people, but in particular, of course, William Walker. So now the building, you can be assured, is safe, sound and secure. Thank you. Well, David, thank you very much for that. Um, I, uh... I'm Tom Watson speaking. I'm one of the trustees of the Friends. And uh, I'd like to thank you very much for a really comprehensive and insightful presentation. And I, it's particularly pleasurable for me because I'm the son of a civil engineer and I know how, how misunderstood they are. And <laughs> so you've done a great job for the civils. Um, and it's, it, you've given a, an amazing story of our... Um, the, the cathedral's rescue and how how a decade a century later it's really good solid work it it worked it's delivered everything that was hoped of the people and and the engineers at the time um, for those who haven't met David before and many of us have David David has written an article on tonight's topic which you can find in the cathedral's um, in, in our what we call record extra which is our online history. Uh, publication, and you can find that at um, wincathedralrecord.org. And I encourage you to all go and look and look for David's article, which was in um, autumn 2018. Now, before I hand over to questions, I'm going to claim privilege and ask David two quick questions. Um, and one of them 
The first one is, did the diver, did diver bill work all year round, including, including winter? And the second one is, roughly on average, how many bags of this dry, dry uh, mix did he place per day in that, at the bottom of that pit, those pits in that dark water? So did he work all year round and any idea how many of these bags did he carry a day? As far as I know, he works all the year round. Right. Um, unlike work above the service where frost would have been a major problem, I think down there 20 feet under, although the water would have been even colder, I don't think there would have been problems with uh, mortar freezing up. So as far as I know, they continued working all the year round. And the second question, just remind me. Oh, roughly how many bags did he carry per day? Well, it was 26,000 over uh, the best part of seven years. If you include for times when they stopped for quite long periods, when they were running out of money, I would say he would probably work for probably altogether just under a thousand days and so you can work out how many bags did I say? Well, 27, th yes. 27 so, bags per day. That's right about 27 bags per day. At the bottom that's, at the bottom of a pit. <laughs> yes. Amazing. But I think the harder work the yeah. harder work would have been digging away at the peat underneath. We know that in some situations he was lying prone with a pickaxe in his hand, digging away at the peat, some of which had come quite compressed under the weight of the cathedral. Anyway, thank you, David, again, that's been terrific. I'm gonna hand back to Lucy and she can manage the, uh, the Q and A's, uh, um, but again, many thanks. Thank you, Tom. Um, now, Dave, we've got a couple of questions which have just come in on the chat. Um, the first question is about what he did at the weekends. Is, is it true that he cycled home every weekend all the way to South London? It is true that he couldn't ride a bike at first, but William West, his assistant, talk, taught him to ride a bike and he rode back one day, one weekend to South Norwood and came back. But as far as we know, I think that was the only time he did it. With such an energetic job to do, I think it's very unlikely that he will want it, having done it once, he would have wanted to do it more times. Thank you for that. Um, there's another question about why was there only one diver? It was an extremely big project. Was there any yeah. reason why that's the way it was yes. organised? That's another familiar question. There was uh, another diver at the beginning, a man called Rayfield. And we understand he worked for about a year, but we don't know exactly why he left um, it, it's unlikely, having known what Walker did and kept at it solidly for all that time, we think it's quite likely that Rayfield wasn't quite as energetic and committed as him. But also, perhaps the most likely thought is that sequencing of work, the big job of digging the pits and uh, after Walker had done his stuff, um, uh, completing and putting the stone back in the pits. They wouldn't want to expose too many open pits at any one time. So I think most likely they found that the sequencing of work for all the other operations involved in building up each pit meant that they really only have, had enough to keep one diver at work at any one time. Thank you. Um, there's another question about um, the kind of conditions of work. Would there have been any lighting that he had when he was down there or was it totally dark? Uh, no, uh, whether lights were ever tried, but in any case, lights were hopeless. 
because the moment he arrived may have been able to see something for the first half minute or so, but as soon as he started moving around and stir up, stirring up the peat, it would have been pitch black. So light wouldn't have been any use at all. Thank you. Um, another question about um, about what supported the walls as he dug out the peat. Was it simply the temporary um, wooden buttresses that supported the peat or um, was there anything else? For each pit, there would have been shoring the sides of each pit. And the reason they only dug out six foot at one time was that would have been relatively easy to support just a small part of the foundation at any one time. And uh, remarkably, there was, there's never, there's no recorded accident, no recorded accident in the whole of the seven years. And Walker himself is on record as paying huge tribute to the men who looked after him and the men who shored up the pits before he went down. And I say it's quite remarkable that there were no accidents recorded at all. Well, that's interesting because there's a couple of comments. Somebody asked about was he in danger of um, the wall collapsing on him? Obviously, we know that never happened. And somebody also asked if he if he ever had to tug three times if he was in danger. But presumably the safety record meant that that, that didn't happen. Uh, there's no record of it happening. But in the um, article I wrote, which Tom has kindly referred to, I quote um, something there from the local paper where he told the Hampshire Gazette, I think it was at that time, not the Chronicle, he told an amusing, he was asked if there were any stories, any amusing stories, and he told a story of um, to do with uh, his connections up by, by uh, his air connections. And he had two pipes, there were two pipes always, one for his air, pumping air to him, and the other pumping water out from the bottom of the pit. And he tells the story, it happened more than once, I gather, someone shouted, stop the pump. And someone rather carelessly stopped his air pump, which didn't please him at all. And he was asked what he had to, what he did, and rather nonchalantly, he's a pretty robust man, was William Walker. He just said, well, I just climbed up out of the pit and I was none the worse for wear. But I think there are two occasions when suddenly his air, his pump, pump, air pump was stopped inadvertently. Thank you, David. Now, just one final question um, before we wrap up. But uh, if, if people have got other questions, feel free to email them to me and David will um, respond to them. And the final question is um, really going back to the beginning is saying, um, do we know why the cathedral started cracking up um, after it had been after being built for so long? Um, that's maybe another a, one. a brief response to that. I'm sure it's quite complicated, but um... I'll, I'll keep it to a minute or two. But it's a very, very pertinent question. Fox pointed out and stated that he was sure the building, parts of the building, had been moving ever since it was built. He had no doubt about that. And uh, if you go into the north transept and look at the plinth, the plinth to the columns in the north transept. And one or two of them have almost sunk down to floor level, where one or two of them are still standing proud about nine inches. And uh, it's pretty clear that those walls were actually sinking as the cathedral was being built. Um, and the, the other thing, to say about that, that the cause of the problem suddenly in the early, early 1900s and obviously late 1800s, we think was possibly caused by the installation of improved drainage systems in Winchester and around the cathedral. There's one very large drain passing very near to the cathedral and uh, there's no doubt that could have caused a significant change to the water table. And 
if the foundations were resting on soaked peat, if drainage channels were then constructed nearby and hence letting that water escape, which would be under pressure, that possibly would have allowed uh, and caused the cathedral to sink. And furthermore, um, Fox did study other parts of the cathedral at that time, and he found quite a few very fresh cracks. So it seems to make sense that at that period of 20, 30 years, the end of the 1800s and 1905 onwards, that there were changes in the water table, which could have been one of the significant causes of it suddenly beginning to show signs of serious settlement. Thank you, David, that's very interesting. Um, well, thank you again for all of you joining us this evening. Um, it's been a fascinating talk by David, really grateful for him to giving his talk to the friends. And we haven't got a talk now for three weeks. Um, our next talk is by trustee Tom Watson, who's talking on the subject of Edward the Martyr. Um, the Murder Mystery King. So that's on Thursday the 18th. So let me know if you haven't already. Let me know if you'd like to join. Um, thank you to all of you who've made donations. We really appreciate them. And I will send out the link afterwards. Again, if you want, if you've got any friends who you think might be interested in this talk, um, just get in touch and I can send you the link. Or if any of you have missed any, but I know some people had problems getting in, I, I can send you the link of the recording and you can, can view it. Um, now, just before we go, I just wanted to pass back to Bruce very briefly. Oh, sorry, actually one thing I meant to say as well, um, I just need, wanted to, give a quick plug for all the Lent activities that are happening online at the cathedral. Um, there is a Lent book group which actually started tonight but you can join um, each week and there is a study day which Mark Byford is um, doing on the 24th of March and there are some other art um, reflections from Sophie Hacker um, so if you are interested in any of those um, activities, go onto the main cathedral website um, and there is a Lent page with all the activities. Um, so that's um, something going on at the cathedral. Um, anyway, and I will just pass back to Bruce, Bruce very briefly. So just, just to add to what Tom Watson said, uh, David, we, I mean, we've had a series of uh, wonderful lectures dur during uh, lockdown. Uh, this has been one of them. Uh, to be honest, David, this is the, the 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 most brilliant, actually, and most comprehensive account of William Walker that uh, that I've ever heard, and and it has been absolutely wonderful. So, yet again, thank you very much indeed. I do wish we were all in an audience together because your applause uh, for this would be magnificent. I don't know whether we can unmute ourselves, but we can all clap now and see if you can hear it. Thank you so much, and and to all the audience as well. Thank you very much for your time. Very sensible. Thank you very much. And um, we'll see you all in three weeks in a day. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Brilliant.